Welcome to Producers Toolbox. I'm your host, Carol Adrian, and today we have a really interesting perspective on how to build up to something that you may have been wanting to do for a long time. If you have felt the creative inside you yearning to compose and record music, direct a film, shoot a TV show, and that creative is rearing up on its hind legs and roaring, this is the show for you. And we're going to tell you how to build up slowly. So I want to start with a capsule of a story. My friend Anthony Junto had a very fancy job in New York City for a long time. He was the uh, Director of Human Resources at 92Y, also known as the 92nd Street Y, with more than a thousand employees and definitely the place in New York for top level world class speakers. And he was very highly regarded there, but he had that urge to be a filmmaker. And so, reading, I'm, I'm definitely condensing this, but reading books, he attended a week long seminar, he wrote some screenplays, and he really advanced to. Uh, writing and directing a feature film about navigating adolescence called Contest. So Anthony Junta, writer, director, filmmaker, producer, um, welcome to Producers Toolbox. He's going to share his story with us. <laughs> hey, Anthony. Thank <laughs> hey, Carol. Thank you. Thank you so much for that that nice introduction. I appreciate it. Um, it's even true. Hello. Oh, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. So um, <laughs> what Carol and I had spoken about was that if I could give you everyone like a little help in terms of just some thoughts that I have as to uh, people who might want to break in, might think about thinking, be thinking about becoming a filmmaker. And, you know, one of the things it's really, really, really easy to get overwhelmed when you kind of, you know, go look through, surf the internet and you see like, oh, wow, you know, this camera does this, this camera's 4K, but this camera's 8K and this piece of equipment, oh my gosh. And, um, you know, editing and everything, it, it can really get overwhelming. And so what I would like to do today is to talk about if, you're going to just be starting out and coming in and a way to do that, that is actually pretty inexpensive, but will give you some real world practical experience. And so if you decide that it is something that you're interested in, then you can kind of build up from there. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things when I write screenplays, one of the things that I like to do is I always like to I mean, obviously put myself in the head of the character that I'm writing. So I put myself in this headspace where I was just like, okay, pretend I'm starting out and, you know, there's not a lot of funds available. What would I do? And um, so anyway, here's, here's what my thoughts are in that mindset, but from the perspective of somebody who's, you know, done this. So the first thing I would recommend you do is to make a short film. And you're like, what? That's kind of crazy. I don't even have an idea for one. Oh my gosh. Um, but I'll tell you why. Uh, when you make a short film, you go through all the same steps, um, albeit on a much smaller scale, as, you know, people go through when they make a feature film. And, you know, obviously, for the most part, when you make a short film, especially your first short film, it's not as, you know, the process of the tools that you use are not as sophisticated as, you know, feature films and, you know, uh, in indie studios, whatever kind of thing. But you do get to go through all those steps and you really do get to learn uh, just by rolling your sleeves up like, oh, wow, this needs to be done. That needs to be done. You know, next thing, next thing, next thing. So that's the first thing that I would recommend. And when I say make a short film, I don't mean it's like, oh, my God, you've got to go out there and you've got to come up with the greatest idea that will get you noticed and get you, you know, your film nominated for an Oscar, your short film. No, I would if I was starting today, what I would do is I'd come up with the simplest idea possible. 
And I think the simplest thing to do is to just get, you know, two characters who happen to have to be wanting two completely opposite things and put them together in a situation where there's going to be conflict. Um, I think you can grab a really good story out of that because that's basically kind of every scene that you write. There's, you know, two people or more uh, with opposition and, you know, what is that struggle? So uh, your first script can be a page or two because you, you're shooting this for you and you're shooting this for experience. You're not shooting this, as I said, to set the world on fire. You really are just shooting it so that you get to learn, you know, how to go from one step to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, so again, start super simple. I would not go any more than two characters because the minute you bring a third in, you're going to realize how that complicates uh, if you've got the third person there doing anything other than observing and there's no reason to have somebody who's just observing. Um, I'm sorry. It might be easier too. I've always thought a kind of good way to go at it and, and get a valuable something out of it too, is to maybe get a little oral history from a family member or a brother and sister talking about growing up for five minutes. It, it You don't really would you say that would work reasonably well if it's not something where you feel compelled to, to create a plot? Um, that, that, that could definitely work, but that kind of brings you a little bit more into documentary. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, but I'm assuming that the audience that I'm talking to are more interested in narratives um, because one of the reasons that I make the suggestion that I do in terms of creating some kind of conflict is because that's going to inform the pace of your edit. Um, you know, documentary, it could kind of be like what we're, you know, almost like we're doing now. I'm just, you know, a little talking head saying uh, a bunch of stuff, but there's not necessarily going to be any conflict involved so there's nothing heightened if you've got conflict involved automatically you kind of build a certain pace in there and when you're you know writing it but certainly when you're directing and certainly when you're editing it you feel like oh wow you know all of a sudden things accelerate you know uh as an argument heightens or a tug of war between, you know, two characters. So that, 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 that's basically my thought, you know, for narrative, for documentary. Yes, absolutely. What you said. Well, either way, what would be, okay. If I'm starting from really nothing and mm -hmm. no budget, what would be the first piece of equipment that I would need to have? Well, I, I think the first thing that you want is you want to be able to write, you know, the screenplay. Um, and let's assume that if you don't have a computer, you have access to a computer or you can, you know, use one at a library or something. And there is a bunch of free screenwriting software online. You know, no, it does not have, you know, the free stuff usually does not have all the bells and whistles and you can't do a lot elaborate pl plotting with it, but you're not going to be doing that for this anyway. So, I mean, right now, if you were to Google something online looking for free uh, screenwriting software, you'd, you'd find a bunch of really, really good options that could totally help you, you know, write a screenplay that's that's formatted, you know, automatically for you uh, in industry standard format so that you get to learn like, oh, that's what a screenplay looks like. I mean, most people have read one, so they, they kind of know. But when you when you're working with it, it's great to have software that formats it for you. And if it's free, it's free. It's awesome. Well, um, in terms of building a, a home studio from the ground up or, or access to studio function, um, would you, can I, sh if I don't have a camera, can I shoot on my phone? Absolutely. You know, uh, most, most phones, you know, obviously smartphones, et cetera, um, you know, do have cameras. And as long as it has a video camera function, you would, you'd be absolutely fine. Um, what, you know, kind of what you want to 
think about is to get yourself out of the mindset of, wow, it has to be um, a phone that uh, shoots in 4K uh, or whatever, because there are phones that do, but they're also very, very expensive. Um, if you have access to one, go for it. Wow, that's awesome. Um, if you don't, you're just starting out. And, you know, um, I would say then whatever shoots video, because remember, what you're trying to do early on is not necessarily get something out into the world, but to go through all the steps that you need to go through. Now, one thing that one mistake I think that a lot of people make, and I certainly did, you know, way back in the day when I started was they're like, oh, I've got a phone and it, you know, it shoots video and uh, it's got audio with it. Don't use the audio on your phone because, I mean, first of all, they're, they're never, you know, for the most part, they're, they're never really as good as some of the uh, freestanding pieces of equipment that, that you can get. There are a lot of portable audio recorders that are out there that are in like the hundred dollar range that shoot excellent, excellent audio. And the audio on your phone will come in handy when you go to sync it, when you go to sync the external audio with, with the audio that's on your phone. And most uh, editing software will you know, automatically sync it uh, by the audio so that you can go in uh, when, when you get to that stage and you can use your phone audio, which is obviously already synced with the picture, with the video, um, to set things and then use the external audio as the one that you're actually using. And then once, once you have it aligned, just cancel out the, um, the, the phone audio. Do you want uh, to need a separate microphone? Are they uh, expensive? It depends. Uh, there are portable audio recorders that have mics built into them. So if you're, you know, if you're just going, I would say pretty much $100, $100 is like the starting point, but you can get real fancy. You can go from there to mics that you can connect. You can go to wireless mics. You can do all kinds of things. And obviously it gets, you know, progressively more expensive, the more bells and whistles that you do. But if I was just starting, I would just get a portable uh, mic that, I mean, a, a portable audio device that has a mic attached to it, point it up off camera, you know, uh, at the actors who are speaking, and the, you will have your audio right there. Great. Now, what about lighting? I know that's a super important factor on any film set and TV, but uh, if you're shooting and, and it's kind of a run and gun thing, um, do we need external lights? I mean, as we're building up, like if, if, if I've tried it and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I, I have a good little five minute story here and my phone is shooting some nice video. I got the audio with even my $25 lavalier mic or whatever I'm using and hopefully building up to something better. But um, do I need, do I need lights? Yes. Uh, well, yes and no. If you're shooting outdoors and, you know, there's some natural light, you know, you don't want direct sunlight, but if there's some natural light, uh, you could be fine without it. Uh, but if you're shooting indoors, yes, you absolutely will. And what I would recommend there is just getting a um, th th they small little cube like lights, uh, little little rectangles. Uh, and they also sell like light rings that can go around your your smartphone. Um, you can pick up a tripod if you want. You know, obviously you, you want to try to well, not obviously, but you, most people want to try to keep the uh, shot steady. You could pick up a tripod for like 30 bucks um, or you could pick up a gimbal that lets you hold the phone steady. But th th those are more expensive to, to get the entry point. There's about like 90 to 100. But. You know, with with a tripod, for example, you have your camera <coughs> and your light ring all there and you basically point it at the actors. And, um, you know, it, it, it'll look really good. You know, I, I think uh, you're saying so much good stuff that's foundational for for what one needs to do. And I always I always forget to mention, but it's been such a help to me. There are. 
YouTube videos on how to do anything. And so I, I will, when I don't know how, and I'm not techie, uh, you know, how do I light this? You know, what's a ring light? I, there are wonderful stuff online that really you can access for free. Uh, and uh, so these are, these are some of the production components that are so important. I mean, we've talked about camera, about lighting, about sound. And I, I do want to point this out uh, because Anthony has evolved like pretty far past. Um, I want to talk a little bit about editing and then I want to show you what his current edit suite looks like. And this is, again, a home studio that he's built up over time. I mean, you really came into it from a completely different universe, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did. And, uh, you know, I will very, very humbly say I knew next to nothing other than writing. Um, and when the opportunity to direct contest, um, I was like, wow, that's awesome. Oh my God. Thank you, Lord. And then I was like, what on earth do I do next? And, you know, it is really just, as you said, there was a lead time of about six months uh, between the time that I knew we were going forward for our pre-production period to when we, you know, cameras started rolling. And I was just like, exactly what you said. I was like, Mr. YouTube um, in terms of, okay, what happens next? What happens next? I can't walk on that set being like, okay, what do I do here? Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously we had, we had a crew, we had people who knew, you know, brilliantly what their uh, jobs were, but I just wanted to be able to talk intelligently to them and, you know, not say like, oh, I think it's kind of like in my head a little bit, you know, and, YouTube did a couple of things for me. It it taught me some real practical skills. And, you know, once I really learned how to take advantage of it, it also taught me how to sift through the materials that are out there in the world, particularly books, um, in terms of, you know, filmmaking, you know, camera work, the audio and all of those things and direct me to, you know, the best of the best, because, um, I needed to start a library pretty quickly and I needed to do a lot of reading and I found what I needed and it was hugely, hugely helpful. Um, so, yeah, you know, you, you take that YouTube advice that you gave and you, you just you'd be amazed what you learn when all of a sudden you have to. Uh, <laughs> I was really impressed when I watched contests. That and if you had said like this is my first film, but some of the shots I was really impressed. There's one early on where the the teenage boy who's really the hero of the film is in the library and he's looking at books on the library shelf, and the shot is from the opposite side of the library shelf. So you're looking right into his face, but the way you framed these different shots, I, I thought, whoa, this is pretty creative. And maybe I heard him wrong and he's done this before. But um, did you really, something in you responded to that inspiration and you really were able to do some compelling framing. We, yeah, and thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, a, a couple of thoughts there. I mean, first I have to, credit like a million years of going to the movies be <laughs> because I think yeah if you feel like you're drawn to this world at all and you know chances are you probably have seen a lot of movies in your life and you know even if you're not like an old dude like me you know even if you're young uh you probably have seen a lot of movies in your young life and what happens with that is you kind of get this feeling inside of you that you know what needs to be done. And then when you read things like the different types of shots and all that, that reinforce it, you know, I mean, no one had ever said to me prior to me making the movie that, you know, the way that shots are set up can often be symbolic for what's going on in the character's head and, you know, you know, all of that type of thing. But I felt that, 
with so many movies in my life. And I, you know, I, I was raised on a lot of movies that are even older than me. Um, and so I saw several, several, several decades of film and how, you know, it evolved and what was good in each era and all of that. And so inside, intrinsically, I kind of knew what I wanted to do visually in, you know, each of the scenes. And then, you know, you, you get the book six months before you're ready to start and a book tells you, you know, just re it just puts it all into words and you're like, oh yeah, well, there, you know, this stuff didn't happen, <laughs> you know, by accident. People, people did that. I mean, I spent probably three out of those six months uh, just working on storyboards, just, you know, drawing my, you know, I'm not, not a great artist, but just drawing little sketches of how I wanted each moment to look in the film. Uh, because I knew, you know, what story the dialogue was telling, but I also knew that what I wanted the visual to tell. One of the most magical parts of production to me is the edit. That where the pieces come together and, and things happen. Uh, and I was very, very surprised when I started, because I came from a different field too, that th there's knowledge that we have. Like you said, we've grown up with movies and TV. And so there's kind of a, a bank of experience in our heads that we're not necessarily in touch with on a front burner level. But once you're in there, you jumped in that water, there's something instinctive, I find, that kicks in, probably because we've been exposed to so much in terms of film and video. Um, and you can read and read and read, but once you're out there like shooting, whether you're shooting on your phone or whether you're shooting with a fancy camera, something is driving you that, that really is leading you to where you see it in your mind to be able to create it on film or video. Um, I want to show your, uh, now you have really evolved far and I want to show your editing setup with mega screens and monitors. And I, I find that so exciting, like just walking into a studio or whether it's a professional studio, a home professional studio, you see all those monitors, you know, amazing stuff is happening there. So did you, I'm, I'm, tell me you started with just one monitor, please. <laughs> yeah, I started with one monitor, you know, on a little tiny laptop. Uh -huh. uh, and then, you know, at, as time goes on and as your skill set increases, um, I mean, you know, I, it's like I fell in love basically three times. I fell in love with writing. I certainly am in love with directing as well. And I did not expect to fall in love with edit editing. I thought it was going to be really tedious. Uh, we had a, a wonderful editor on contest. And, you know, after his work was done, I stepped in to kind of take the unofficial role of, of senior editor. And so I learned a lot from what he did. Mm -hmm. And then I learned how I wanted to, you know, further shape each of the scenes. And, you know, whatever I'm doing at that moment, is like my favorite thing. If I'm writing, oh, oh writing's my favorite. If I'm directing, oh, it's directing. <laughs> the best. Um, and essentially what's happened since then is, you know, one by one, I kind of got additional screens. Like most people will use like two or three. You know, I, I use five. And the reason that I use five too is I have one screen that is just strictly for like notes for me because you know i'm i'm not, I'm not a kid I'm, I'm older and i like to be able to just glance over to my right and see like okay here's my list of all the changes that i want to make in this scene my little bullet point list and i you know i don't feel like looking down at a piece of paper i, I want a screen just for notes with big writing on it <laughs> that i can read and i can go through and you know uh highlight when it's crossed off you know the type of thing uh, but that's, you know, I use every screen that I've got, um, you know, and sometimes it's I'm working on the picture part and I need one of the screens just to to test a sound thing that I'm working on so that I can always I, I never 
I never want to have anything in front of what I'm working on at that moment on any given screen. I just need each screen to, to do what it's, you know, what it's supposed to do at that moment. I know what you mean. When I go into edit or when we're doing voiceover recordings in the studio, I like to have it up on the screen, but I also like to have a printout in my hand that I can scribble on. And, and it, there's just, I think as, as any of us go through the process, we're going to find out what makes us more comfortable or what's more exciting or more convenient to use. I do want to point out too, to our audience that there's an amazing array of services and ways to learn available. And sometimes I, I have had great experience with our uh, public access cable stations. And some of the larger ones have programs with classes and lending equipment for free. There's really, um, we're in a time when there's a lot available to the incoming filmmakers, whatever age we are, that you can just immerse yourself with professional guidance with some of this stuff. Well, I really want to thank Anthony. That's, um, I've seen so much of your work and he does creative work, corporate work, sound. I mean, he's come a long way. And, and I thought it was a very brave step when, when you made a hard right from being a suit in New York City <laughs> to being a filmmaker, uh, freelance, it's, it's quite a, a huge change. But uh, would you say it's been gratifying? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that, you know, honestly, there has never been a day where I've regretted making that move. Um, you know, obviously, in the beginning, um, you know, you're at a certain level in the corporate world. So the money is going to be different than just starting, you know, in a in a creative a aspect. But, you know, it's not all about money. It's, it's about enjoying what you're doing. And I absolutely yeah love what I do. And, um, you know, I'm very gratified to have had the other life because it informs you know, a lot of my creative writing. And um, it's a perspective that a lot of writers don't have who just start out writing. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just basically pretty grateful for the way that the trajectory of, you know, life and career and, and all that has gone. That's really great to hear. And I, I feel the same way that it, it felt like coming home. And so I hope anybody who feels their inner creative just bursting to get out that you will be inspired and validated by Anthony's experience. And maybe you'll put a toe in that deep water and think of something for five minutes that you can shoot and edit. And who knows where that will lead. So thank you so much for joining us on Producers Toolbox. And uh, we're putting up Anthony's contact information at the end if you have any questions for him. And I really look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm.